calls. And so, anyway, you want to take it away? Hey, well, great to be here. Uh, I'm actually a um, professor at Iowa State, uh, in addition to uh, uh, being running, and he did mention, I'm running for governor as well. But uh, I'm in my capacity here as uh, the chairman of the Libertarian Party of Iowa. But I am at Iowa State, uh, I'm a professor there, and I actually am the advisor for the Iowa State chapter of Young Americans for Liberty. Uh, and I spoke to the Iowa Young Americans for Liberty. So those of you who are members of that uh, group, I hope we can forge uh, maybe closer ties. What I'm going to talk to you, I guess, I teach, uh, I'm an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience. Well, uh, here's my goal today. My goal today is to explain to you what libertarianism is. I'm not going to try and convince you to be a libertarian. That would be a bit much to ask in a 30-minute talk. But here's my goal, is that when we're all done, you'll be able to say, oh, I know how the libertarians would feel about that particular issue. So that's what we're looking for. So where are we? What are uh, libertarians? Uh, let's think about uh, politics and the typical uh, way we think about the traditional view of political philosophy. And that is that political philosophy is kind of a unidimensional scale. It goes from left wing over here and the moderates in the middle and then right wing over here. And so we all know some of the things we probably associate with left wing and right wing positions. So left wing positions would be like they'd be say more tolerant of high taxes, right wing would want lower taxes. Left wing would kind of be more tolerant of gay marriage, right wing less tolerant. Uh, more tolerant of uh, drug use, medical marijuana would be kind of a left wing issue, uh, right wing less tolerant of that. Uh, more regulation of business uh, according to the left wing view and less regulation on the right wing view. So that's kind of traditionally how we uh, imagine the political spectrum. Now the question is, um, okay, who are you close to? Where would you put yourself on this scale? Well, that's a hard thing to answer because I'm not sure the scale is quite adequate. Uh, I was interviewed, I went to Dubuque a few weeks ago, I got interviewed by a reporter there who didn't know a single thing about libertarians, except she had been told that we were the extreme right-wing fringe of the Republican Party, that we were the folks who think the Republicans are a bunch of commies, that's who uh, libertarians are. And so her idea was, if you'd asked her where we are on the scale, she would have said, they are out here. I mean, these people are beyond Hitler. They're like Hitler squared, is what she thought. You kind of had to see the fear in her eyes while she was interviewing me, because they're interviewing Hitler squared. Now, on the other hand, uh, last time Ron Paul ran uh, for uh, the president uh, during the Iowa caucuses, uh, I was actually, I was the Iowa campus coordinator uh, for the Ron Paul campaign. 2007. My boss, who was the state coordinator for the campaign, was a very, very conservative Republican, so uh, he, he may have been uh, around here. Uh, and uh, his nickname for me, uh, behind my back, was that crazy hippie, uh, is what he called me. If you asked him to put me on the scale, he would have said, oh, he is out here, he is beyond Stalin. Well, now, how can I be both places on this scale? That doesn't make much sense. And what I think is, the problem is that the unidimensional scale doesn't work. It really doesn't capture American politics very well. What I want to argue for is a bi-dimensional scale. So let me show you that. Let's take a two-dimensional view of political philosophy. And the two dimensions are, we're going to have one dimension for personal freedom that can go from low to high, and one on economic freedom that can go from low to high. And so, uh, personal freedom issues, I mean things like medical marijuana, uh, that somebody who's favored that would be high on personal freedom. Somebody who doesn't have a problem with, say, legalizing prostitution or gay marriage, somebody who's opposed to, say, the military draft, they would be people who are high on personal freedom. Uh, and persons opposed to all those things would be low. And then similarly, economic freedom, people who want low taxes, less regulation on business, say, a low minimum wage, those folks would be high on economic freedom, and folks that want a lot of government control uh, over the economy, they'd be low on economic freedom. So what that creates is kind of this two-by-two two table of possibilities. So our old uh, axis, the old unidimensional scale, would go here. So yeah, liberals and conservatives are opposite <coughs> one another. What we'd say is what a liberal is, is somebody wants high personal freedom but low economic freedom. What a conservative is, is somebody who wants high economic freedom but low personal freedom. But that creates two new uh, quadrants here. And the quadrant we're going to talk about here is the libertarian. <coughs> what we want is we want high personal freedom combined with high economic freedom. So that's why we wind up in this quadrant here. 
And rather than being both beyond Stalin and beyond Hitler, the folks who want low uh, economic freedom and personal freedom, the kind of this uh, authoritarian quadrant down here. Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to this, but what I wanted to talk about then is, well, so uh, why are libertarians up here? I mean, what's going on that led us to be in this quadrant where we want both high economic freedom and high personal freedom? Really what libertarianism is, it's a philosophy of Thomas Jefferson. Okay? And so let me describe the basics of Jefferson's philosophy to explain why we wind up in this quadrant here. What Jefferson pointed out is the government in a society is the institution that's allowed to use force, physical violence. There are some activities that require force, and the reason why we have a government is because we need an institution that can perform those activities. Now, the activities that require force, I would say, are the following. First is protecting people from body crimes. By body crimes, I mean things like murder and rape and assault. That requires force. Second would be protecting people from property crimes. And by property crimes, I mean <coughs> theft and vandalism. But it also include fraud. Uh, that would be a property crime. And pollution. I would also consider that a property crime because you're, you know, dumping your stuff on other people's property. Right? So that's a property crime too. Third, enforcing the terms of contract. So if there's a contract dispute, uh, I say I've conformed to the contract. Somebody else says uh, I haven't. We can go to the government and get that dispute resolved and then the government has to use force to enforce the, the terms of the contract when we're all done. And then fourth, there's certain categories of uh, economic goods that people need that the market, for one reason or another, doesn't supply in the appropriate amounts left to its own devices. And those are called public goods. And those of you who have taken Econ 101, you know about some of these public goods. The most classic one they always give in Econ 101, if you took it, of a public good is light <coughs> can't really make money operating a lighthouse, and so we need the government to provide lighthouses. Uh, laying roads might require eminent domain, so that might be a legitimate function of the government, but maintaining roads doesn't. So I think most libertarians would say, well, after the roads have been laid, they should be treated like a public utility, like the electric company or the cable TV company. There should be a private company operating the roads with some sort of government oversight. So that would be public good. But that's it. I mean, these are the four activities that the government needs to do. And what libertarians would say is it shouldn't do anything beyond those four activities. Now, why do we say that? Well, the reason we say that is because the government's a monopoly. And like all monopolies, it has very little incentive to please its customers and very little incentive to be cost effective. When we give more and more responsibility to the government, we are giving more and more responsibility to the least efficient institution our society. So that's why the presumption is that government shouldn't be taking care of a lot of the things it's taking care of now. So when I say that, you know, you notice this, these four things wouldn't include something like trash collection, for example. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any trash collection. What I'm saying is it shouldn't be the government that is providing the trash collection. That's what I'm saying. To you. So that's the idea. So now there are two then key concepts of libertarianism. First one is limited government. What we are saying is that the government should be limited to those specific activities that require force. Now, I would be willing to say that the government may collect taxes in order to fund those four activities that require force, but it may not collect one penny more in taxes than it needs to supply those activities. Anything beyond that is, we would say, immoral. It should not part of limited government. And then the second key concept is that we live in a free society. That is, if you're mentally an adult, you're not committing any body crimes, you're not committing any property crimes, you're honoring any contracts you've made, if you're doing all those things, you should be a free person. You are able to do whatever you want with your life. You should be able to live how you want. That's what it means to live in a free society. So those are the basic ideas, limited government and a free society. Okay, well now let's...